the final class in our three-part series on gossip. We overviewed a lot, tried to make it very practical, lots and lots of response because everyone can relate to this. And then gave a very new, deep, positive way to overcome this temptation. Total transformation of the whole issue. Hope you enjoy. Okay, this is our third and final class on this topic of being a moral person, not gossiping. And today I want to go a little bit into, so what, you know, what's the positive, the flip side? But what we've discussed is that for a Noahide, from two perspectives, one has to be careful not to gossip. He said it's a fundamental of faith to be a moral person and a moral, godly person does not gossip. So therefore you can't. And the second reason why a Noahide cannot gossip, we said is actually a subsidiary branch of the prohibition of murder. Because under the prohibition of murder is a prohibition of harming a person. And under harming a person includes embarrassing a person, includes gossip, includes tail bearing. Even though these aren't physical harms, they could of course be far more grievous, far more painful and far more damaging. So for both of those reasons, a Noahide absolutely is forbidden to gossip. Interesting, because on Yom Kippur, we have 44 confessions, meaning we say the confession actually 10 times over the Yom Kippur services. And each time we're saying 44 confessions, 10 out of the 44 have to do with speech. One with gossip, one with evil tale bearing, but 10 out of the 44. And sometimes when I'm like, good, <laughs> before Yom Kippur, I review the confession because, you know, when you're praying, it's a little busy and a little quick. I sort of want to know in advance the ones I really need to focus on and always those ones with speech just fly at me because, of course, they're, they're so relevant. And we're told actually spiritually it's sort of like killing the person, which maybe relates back to the Noahides prohibition for gossip being under the prohibition for murder. Because based on the Talmud, the founder of Hasidism, the Baal Shem Tov, says that when you gossip is killing three. The person who thought up the idea, the person who's telling it, and the person who's listening. And as we discussed last week, that and the week before, I believe we touched on it as well, that we sometimes think, well, I don't want to hear this, but what am I supposed to do? No, the person listening also is spiritually suffering, just like the person who's saying it and the person who dreamt it up in the first place. Now, there's a number of categories within gossip, all of which are forbidden. The three basic categories would be like, the first one is sort of like repeating innocuous gossip. Maybe there's nothing wrong with what you're saying about the person. It's nothing mean. It's nothing nasty. You're not saying they're doing anything wrong. Like I said, oh, so-and-so bought a house. So-and-so's expecting. So-and-so's engaged. There's nothing. It's all true and nothing's bad. But we said even there it's forbidden unless there's a compelling reason to say it. Why? Because you never can foresee what could be the negative consequences. You never know someone that might say, really? Her? Him? Uh, uh, uh. Has anyone been in such a situation where like they said something nice, innocent about someone and like, whoa, did it open up something? I don't ever been in that situation because it's oh, not yes. so rare. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Too many times. Too many yeah. times. So Dixie said too many times. Danielle said yes. And I'm sure Crystal's in the situation. I've been in the situation. It's how are we supposed to know? We we truly meant nothing wrong. We were just, you know, sharing. We might say we had positive intentions, or more likely we were just letting our mouths move. So we didn't really have any intentions. We're just, you know, yapping filling up the air with, with our speech that we have a tendency to like to do. And, and whoa, whoa, we, we didn't mean anything like that at all. Oh, no. But it, it really, really heightens this point because we've all experienced it. One time or too many times, 
that really, yes. And the sages say that even innocent, innocuous conversations, things that aren't any color of bad, not, well, yeah, you could interpret that as bad. No, there's nothing bad. You're saying, oh, my child has so-and-so as a teacher. I'm so happy. She's such a wonderful teacher. I mean, you're only saying nice things and you mean them. How are you supposed to know that this person doesn't like so-and-so or had a very bad experience? Or So we have to be so careful with what comes out of our mouth. And basically, we don't talk about people. That's the bottom line. If we're not allowed to say, unless you have a real strong reason to, oh, so-and-so is such a wonderful teacher. My son has her this year. She's so wonderful. No, don't say that. You never know. So what does that mean? That means don't talk about people. That's the most mild category, repeating innocent words. Then there's what we called evil talk last week, which is speaking about another person's indiscretions, shortcomings, saying not nice things about another person. Now, again, here, as far as you know, this is 100% true. We're not yet talking about making up stuff, but 100% true where we said even worse. This is called evil, bad talk. And of course, sometimes you were hurt by someone and, you know, you want to share. You want to talk about it. You want to talk about it at least to your spouse, you know, or to your friend, your good friend. And you're going to tell it not to tell anyone. It helps is just thinking if I say bad about a person, I'm strengthening the bad inside of them. That's not worth doing or whatever else you can do for yourself. Anyone has any good thoughts of how they do not share even to a spouse or a best friend when something happened that hurt them and they really want to tell someone about it? Any tips? <laughs> Are there any tips? No, because this is where I really str struggle. So I'm hoping somebody <laughs> has <tips. laughs> No, I don't, because the problem we have to face with that is... Are you going to do more harm than damage? I mean, no, more good, more damage than good. What do you mean, Dixie? Well, is telling the other person going to affect the relationship? No, what I meant was you got hurt by Jane. She really messed you over. She was so rude to you. Last week, you ran around town driving her here, there, and everywhere. And this week, you passed her in the store. She didn't even say your hello. She didn't respond to your hello, whatever. And you're really hurt. And you just want to tell someone because that's the nature of man. So how do you control yourself? That's exactly what I'm going through right now. I want to tell people about a hurt that, that I've been caused deeply. And um, I have to be careful how I say this because then I, I'm going to fall into it again. And so you have to pick the person very carefully that you tell is the only thing I can say. Because you could cause a lot more damage. Oh, I see what you're saying. What you're saying is you're ready. I resign that you're going to say it, but you want to pick carefully the person you're going to say it to, because if you pick the wrong person, it's going to create even more problems. You got it. I got it. And, and, that, it. and that's very true. And that might be a tip to help you keep your mouth closed. Because if you yeah. think, wait, I remember in the past when I shared my pain with Mary, and then what happened, I thought Mary was discreet, but boy, was I wrong. And I remember when I shared my pain with Susan, and oh, yeah, that was even worse. That might help you from talking to anyone. Just talk to God. Pour it out to God. You got it. That's the only way you can do it. Only, me. only no. safe option. Christelle. So I was just going to say, what about concepts? You know, I mean, you don't have, I think you had mentioned this last time, you know, we can talk about concepts, not people. So, I mean, in the case where someone's very hurt, for instance, and, you know, you have something that's going on. You know, of course, you, like you said, it's, you have to be very careful not to share too much information with somebody who might understand who you're speaking of. But, um, you know, there may be 
you know, there may be somebody like a trusted partner, like your husband or your, you know, somebody that a mentor, you know, where you can't say, hey, I've got this concept going on and I'm really struggling with this. Can you help me with that? You could definitely do. And the best would be to have a good friend or mentor who's not, I mean, a husband this probably wouldn't work with, but a friend or mentor who's maybe not within your circle. If it's a work mm-hmm. thing, you could speak to a, a neighbor that you trust. If it's a neighbor thing, <laughs> you could speak to, you know, your good friend from college or your mentor. Like, yes, you want to, I think what you're saying is a very good way to handle it a way because what you're saying, Christelle, so you're raising this up a bunch of notches. You're saying we're not talking because we have just a need to talk. You're saying we have a need to process. Yes. And as a need to process, we do have a need to process. And processing is good. Because if we take that made up scenario I gave, I think I was remembering Dixie's story of once how she drove all over miles and miles for someone. Maybe that was the impetus for the story I made up. But um, but if something like that happens, so you have to process, you have to process your hurt and say like, so next time, I shouldn't be nice to people or I should only be nice to people that I think are going to be nice back. Or when I wasn't doing it, was I thinking she was going to be nice back? I wasn't trying. But then why did it hurt me so much? So processing a situation like that would be very healthy because you would want to come to a healthy outcome, which is that you're still committed to help people, even if they might ignore you the next week. (laughs) Um, So processing is good. You said a mentor. A mentor is a very good person. Because you know when you're talking to a mentor, you are talking to process. You are not talking in the name of yapping about someone. You are truly doing it to process. And when you're being careful. And if it's a person that's not in your world, you know, the details aren't going to make a difference. And if it's someone in your world, not saying any, as much as you can, not saying any identifying details, that's good. If you don't have a mentor and you have a wise friend, you could maybe pick a person like that and say, okay, this is going to be my friend that I go to when I need to process. But I want to tell myself very clearly, this is only for processing. Even though I really would just like to talk about it. But I'm not going to do that. I'm processing. Processing is to for me to walk away and say, so how am I going to be different? Did I do something wrong? Or... How am I going to react in another situation? Am I going to be affected by this one and be different and not be as warm and nice and giving? Or can I still be warm and nice and giving and yet hold myself back and say, I don't want to make myself vulnerable and feel like now I have this deep relationship with this person. Maybe for me, this is amazing. Maybe for her every day, someone else in town does this for her. So she doesn't even realize. She just takes it for granted. Maybe. And I can have compassion for someone that lives like that and move on. So yes, I I agree with Christelle, and that might be a very good way to elevate the need to yap to the need to process without incriminating details. Danielle, would that help you or would that not help? I think so, yeah. Um, I can try it. (laughs) (laughs) You can tell this. here, of course. (laughs) Yes, you can tell this is something that certainly I, yeah. Like I said, I struggle with this, but I can like see like little loopholes. Like I'm already doing that in my head. Like, oh yeah, I could do this. I could. (laughs) Right. So that's why I like the idea of picking one person, a mentor, a confidant who's, who you feel has wisdom and has perspective and could give you good perspective on it. So that right away cuts away like, you know, a lot of your friends and cuts away the like, (laughs) openness of just when you're upset and the first person that you happen to meet or call to you you know yeah you know pouring it all out to no 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 I'm only like that person so I can't say it to this person I can't say it to this person a spouse is another person some people think gossiping with spouses don't count but do like one person it does count it does count so that, that that that's no no loophole there so if you think of I'm processing it's a mentor-like figure, and I'm selecting one person who is my mentor-like figure in this. It might, like, till you get all those pieces in place, it might sort of, like, calm down the situation. It, like, drops a bunch of notches. So by the time you say it, you're not even as worked up as you were original. I think that's also a good point. In general, 
like going on Christelle's perspective of I want to process it, I want to have a mentor. It's best to also have some time between the situation and when you talk. Because the more time elapses, the more you naturally have perspective and the less you're emoting it and the less intense it is and the less you're worked up on it. And actually the processing could actually process. And then it's not a venting session. It really is a processing session. But if like right away you pick up the phone and you call your mentor, friend, confidant, and you just pour it all out. I think like Danielle's saying, the processing with the mentor becomes the yapping, gossiping with the friend. And it's, it's that line gets crossed. So I think time, putting space between that call and what happened also would really make a big difference. Well, I hope we'll hear wonderful reports on how this really helps someone. Now, there's a third category. So we said the first category, so we said there's a third category now. The first category was innocent words that happen to trigger someone. So don't talk about people. The second category is negative words. That's called evil speech. And the third category, which is even worse, is when it's unfounded, when it's libel, when you're making up stories, when you're taking something you have heard and, and you know, put together, decided, or just don't like the person and ran with something. Oh, that doesn't happen. No, that happens all the time. It happens all the time. Unfortunately, it's something we many times might have been a victim of. You know, people sometimes tell themselves it's just words. There are so many situations that have happened of words causing catastrophic harm. And it's so hard to take back. There's a famous story. I've heard many versions of it. But a um, man, woman, doesn't make a difference. So, somebody who was very indiscreet with their speech and would like to talk about people, as many people have that pleasure. Doesn't cost money. Doesn't cost calories. You know, it's, 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 it's a cheap, free, easy indulgence. And something happened that made them realize it was wrong. And they went to a, a rabbi. Like, how can I repent? You know, all these years, I always talk about people. And they're ever said, I have an idea for you. Said, you own a feather pillow? Yeah, sure. Say, great. Go to the middle of the marketplace, take your feather pillow and slash it down the middle. Huh? That's what you have to do. Okay, the rabbi said. Take the feather pillow, go to the middle of the marketplace, slash it down the middle. Come back to the rabbi. Now what? The rabbi said, now gather all the feathers. Oh, that's impossible. That's my point. So it's unfortunately happens. And unfortunately, it's one of those things that are really, really hurt to rectify. Um, has anyone ever... Has anyone ever been in this type of situation where they were aware or involved, where someone said something, made up some story? I mean, basically, they might claim they didn't make it up completely, but basically made up a story or said nasty things about someone and that really harmed a person. Unfortunately, it happens. It really happens in life. It really happens that people decide they're putting one and one together and making a new creative very distorted too. And then they talk about it. And then other people treat the person differently because of it. And sometimes really horrible things happen because of those, those things that people say about other people. So I, I have just, I have had this experience and unfortunately um, it's been a, a thing, but um so sometimes it's not even as blatant as like, oh, I'm going to make up this story and I'm going to say blah, blah, blah. But sometimes it's been the case where, you know, somebody is, you know, confronted with something or a boundary is set. And then the pain of that is too much for them to take on the responsibility. And so they were like, oh, well, this wasn't me. I would have never done this. It was so and so that told me something, blah blah blah, or did what, or did something, blah blah blah, that made me have this reaction to come be, you know. And the thing is, is that, you know, there it's com 
completely untrue or or they've taken something completely out of context but it's just because in that moment they're in so much pain themselves they're just trying to deflect the the boundary that somebody else just set up and unfortunately i found myself in the position of the person that's like well i'll just take the blame for everything (laughs) you know that sounds like a real healthy response crystal (laughs) i'm a small at all i mean yeah i mean you know just in past relationships and stuff it's it's been like it was that was my my role was the problem so you know so i think like you know, once you're aware of it and you can see it, you know, it, it change it just changes stuff. But I mean, it's, that is one thing that I have come to see that, you know, it wasn't malicious intent, even necessarily, even in that case, it was just that the other person was experiencing so much pain that they didn't know what to do with it. They couldn't hold it. And I think sometimes that might be why people talk about other people to deflect their own situations you know, and, and, and it truly is honestly a pleasure. And I totally agree with you that many people are not thinking, hmm, what story can I make up about her? I don't think so many people are like that. But I think people like start saying something, but then they just make it a lot more dramatic and a lot more extreme because there's more audience attention. There's more involvement. You're getting more focus. So you take something and then somehow as you give it over, you just dress it up and dress it up and dress it up. And then it becomes a, a very different situation. So you didn't start off saying, I want to make up a story about so-and-so. But in the end of the day, that's what you did. Dixie, what were you going to add? I was going to say that a lot of time it's unintentional. Because you start out with being hurt, and so you re- you tell somebody you're hurt, but then it gets back that in a whole different situation, that it wasn't even said in the way that I intended to say it, but I, I said it wrong. And so our, our vocabulary is a very important thing on how we transmit things. And I have a very bad English vocabulary. So unfortunately, I cause a lot of hurt because my, I do not say things right in the right context. And it's not what I meant, but it's how it come out. It's how the other person perceives it is a lot of times a huge problem for me. I hear you. So that what you're saying is... You were trying to make up a story, but somehow how your story got understood and interpreted was a few steps away from the truth in a in a more sensational fashion, yeah. in a much worse fashion. So what exactly. you're saying is you have to be so careful with the words you use and going back to what you were saying before, with who you say anything to, just that point of discretion. Yeah. And people aren't discreet. So let's accept that. People aren't discreet. You're yeah. going to say something and you know it'll go flying. Talk to God. People aren't discreet, especially if it's juicy, if it's interesting, if they'll get attention for repeating it. People are not discreet. I have learned when people tell me something to very carefully try and dismiss it with them um if they're talking about someone else and and i'm the third party i try and say well that's interesting and drop it and and don't let it go any farther that's it that's that's good i mean better is not even to allow yourself to hear it because again listening makes you party to the gossip but Mm -hmm. definitely being dismissive and not giving the person attention and focus and really and she did and oh my gosh and how did you respond and I can't believe it that that's good um but then they just might want it so they'll go to someone else to get all that but but definitely again we do have to remember when we are listening to gossip even if we don't want to be listening to the gossip and we're thinking get me out of here 
I do not accept this. I do not accept this. I do not believe this. I do not believe this. We're human and it trickles in and we generally perceive the other person differently because of it. Very, very, very hard not to. And you can never let that go is the worst problem is once that, that their reputation has been damaged with you, even though it's not true, it always sits in the back of your mind. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It does. And that's why listening is considered equally wrong as saying, because if it wasn't equally wrong, then the person would say, I'm just listening. I'm not, I don't want to hear this. What am I supposed to do? But exactly what Dixie just said, when you hear it, it affects you and you remember it, even if you don't want to remember it. And most of the time we think differently about the other person, even if we don't want to. We're just human and we do. We were affected and it's really horrible, but I'm sure we've all had the situation, something you heard really bad 10 years ago about a person could pop up when there's a situation involving that person in your life. You remember, we do remember. So that's why it's so significant not to listen because listening affects us. Even if we say, I don't accept this, I don't accept this, I don't accept this, we still hear it. It changes us. And yes, as Dixie said, when a reputation is damaged, you know, how do you, how, how do we repair that? Bro, I was going to say, I had a really interesting experience like with a couple of different people. And, you know, whenever it came to gossip and just saying like, you know, I just don't really feel comfortable talking about other people. And then I would be, I was told, like, I was no fun. <laughs> okay, so you're no fun. Yeah, that's know. a very good way to say it. I, I don't feel comfortable talking about other people. That's a beautiful line. That's true. I mean, you have to either politely excuse yourself and just walk away. I'm so sorry. I just remembered something. Bye. <laughs> or change the subject. Or explain why you don't want to listen. I don't feel comfortable talking about other people. And then they say, you're no fun. And honestly, if this is this person's definition of fun, better you should be no fun. Exactly. Of course, if you're a teenager and this happens all the time, it hurts a lot. But hopefully mm -hmm. as an adult, it's okay. You can bear the pain. Yeah. <sighs> Absolutely. Yeah. It just, I mean, and it just lets me know, like, if these are people I can't share stuff with. And so it puts the friendship, although, you know, we're still friendly and stuff. It just puts me in a different place as far as like, you know, uh, how close I would ever be with that person. That is such a true point. I actually recently had this situation. If you see people gossip, you definitely don't want to share things with them. I literally had this situation a few weeks ago and it was, it really cost. I, um, I get, I was wrong. But I was talking to someone who I haven't seen for years and I'm close to and uh, for it was very nice speaking to them. And I should have realized because over the course of the conversation, they shared a lot of things that they didn't really need to share with me. Now, I didn't view it as gossip because, you know, in my position, in my relationship with these people, I thought that's why she was telling me this. But afterwards, when I was rethinking the whole situation, I was like, that should have been a big, big, huge red flag. Like, what is she telling me all this private stuff about these other people for? Like, no, I don't need to hear it. And no, it's not relevant to me now. And I don't, whatever. But I didn't realize. Anyway, then she said to me about a certain person, oh, she's married, right? And I knew this person just got divorced. So I sort of like stuck. I didn't want to like say she's a boy. Like, ah, yeah. You know, I don't want to talk about someone else. But I, I didn't. I'm like, what am I going to do? Why? So I said, you know, she just got divorced. I moved on. I didn't say a word about it. I didn't say a word, like nothing. Obviously, I was not yapping about another person at all. Anyway, later, this, this person went to that person and said, oh, I hear you got divorced. I was like, oh, created tremendous damage in my relationship with her. Um, and I, I, I just was like, what was I supposed to do? And I thought it over and I said, what I was supposed to do in, in that situation, it just makes some vague statement. Like, I don't really know what's going on in her life. You know, that's probably better to do that than to do what I did. 
especially knowing the damage that incurred. So yes, Christelle's a hundred percent correct. If you see people of the type that talk, yeah. you have to be so careful what you say to them. And then they'll talk about you too. Because I mean, if they're talking about other people, then that means that they're going to talk about you too. Um, my my uh, well, I was uh, told like a comment to say whenever people ask you about other people, it'd be like, you know, I, I you know, you should ask that person. That's a good line. Again, if someone's asking you a question, may ask them directly. I don't really know. I haven't had that experience. Yeah, you'll have to ask them. Ask anyone family. else what they've done when they've been in the situation, because we've all been in that situation so many times. Someone's talking about someone else. You really don't want to hear it. What do you do? That is, that depends upon the situation at the time, what you can do without causing more damage. So any any good, positive, any success stories? We really don't want to listen to this stuff. It's going to, I'm going to remember forever. It's going to color how I view the person. It's, it's a spiritual death of a certain type. It's a transgression and I try to be close to God. Anyone have anything that works? So you could try Christelle's line. I don't like talking about other people. I don't like listening to talk about other people. If you don't feel you could be so upfront, you don't want to be accused of being no fun. So just... Maybe like Dixie said before, just don't energize it and change the conversation. Oh, and, you know, and then just move on to something else that, you know, this person might have some passion about, but that's not people. You know, the rising cost of inflation, how expensive it is to fill up your car for, with gas, whatever, you know, <laughs> something that, mm -hmm. that's not about a person. As we're saying, you have to be careful with compliments when you're talking to people. You really need to think, who am I talking to? Will they object? Will they say it's not true? She's not. Will the compliment be viewed as an insult? If someone would say, so Christelle said, if someone asks her about someone, she says, you know, I don't really know. Ask them directly. She has to even say that the right way. Because if someone would say, oh, don't ask. I don't really want to talk about that person because I'm so holy and I don't gossip. So I don't want to talk about that person. That's a lot of implied gossip in saying, I don't want to talk about that person. You know, like, like in other words, that, 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 that. You can only imagine what I have what to say, but I'm not going to talk about that person. So even when you say that line, you have to say it really carefully. And again, if you really feel a need to talk about someone else, remember, as you talk bad about a person, you are strengthening their bad. And uh, you really, 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 some of us have to fight ourselves a lot on this to, to, to be loyal to God in this situation. So we can spend a lot of time struggling with ourselves to make sure we don't say bad. And, you know, maybe it's really hard and maybe you have a lot of years of doing it. So that muscle is very strong. We got to just fight and fight and fight because it's really bad and God really doesn't want it. And it's viewed as a type of murder. And it's in a sense, spiritually killing me. And I, I just got to really, really struggle with myself. But there's, there's something more than that. Because it's not only that we shouldn't say bad about people. What our goal really is, is to respect and love other people. And the more we respect and love other people, that's going to automatically remove your desire to talk bad about them. That's automatically going to heighten your sensitivity when you're in a situation and other people are talking about them. Because if I really care about the other person, I definitely don't want to share. Even if I witness some indiscretion on this person's part, if I respect them, if I care about them, if I love them, I'm not going to share that. I don't embarrass them that way. And if I care about them and someone else is saying something not nice about them. I don't want to be part of that. I care about them. I don't want to hurt them. So if we really 
focus. In other words, what I'm saying is there's sort of two roads to dealing with ourselves with this gossip situation. And one road is really just controlling ourselves and not letting ourselves speak negatively or listen to negative talk or for that matter, you gotta be careful if you speak any talk about another person. The other road, the stronger road, the better road, the higher road is to really work on caring about people, on respecting people, loving people. I don't just mean specific people in your world. I mean people in general. Because it really automatically removes any desire to talk negatively about them. So in Tanya, which is a seminal work of Chabad Hasidus, the end of chapter 12, the author of the Tanya, which we refer to as the Alta Rebbe, discusses how you're supposed to treat people. I mean, here's talking about people that have harmed you, which is often the type of people we gossip about. Or sometimes we gossip about other people who haven't harmed us, but they're just interesting people to talk about. But we also have a tendency to talk about people that have harmed us. So the Rebbe says here, and I just wanted to bring it in because I thought it was so powerful in terms of going to a higher level of not just don't talk about the person, but of really working on feeling good to the person. So the Rebbe says, when we're talking about interpersonal issues, this is the last section of chapter 12 of Tanya. Immediately, when it I'm just translating it sort of directly and then we'll discuss it. Immediately, when it comes up to your heart from your brain. Any grudge, any hatred, any negative emotion, God forbid, any jealousy, any anger, any anything, any animosity, any grudge, anything similar to this. So as soon as you have any negative energy toward another person, whatever color or flavor it is, immediately you don't accept it at all consciously in your mind and in your will. Meaning we all have our subconscious and our subconscious can sense us lots of unwanted mail. So when my subconscious is sending me negative feelings, and it's making sure what a negative feeling is, anger, jealousy, a grudge, hatred, any negative feeling about another person, I have a choice to accept it. Immediately, the Rebbe says, this is a no-brainer. Immediately reject it. And it's the opposite. The brain rules the spirit in his heart to do literally the opposite. Meaning, for whatever reason, I mean, there's a reason your subconscious will suddenly trigger to make you really upset at the person. You don't just reject it, so I'm not going to be upset at that person. I'm not going to feel this grudge. I'm not going to feel this jealousy. I'm not going to feel this anger. No, the Rebbe says, you have to behave the opposite. To behave with this person with kindness, with affection, extra affection, extra kindness to forbear them till the nth degree, not to get angry, not to repay how they treat you. Oh, well, she did this and this to me. It's the opposite. We have to repay those that are guilty to us with good. As explains in the Zayar to learn from Yosef with his brothers. Yosef, Joseph, and his brothers. So what is the Rebbe referencing from the Zohar? What happened with Joseph and his brothers? So of course, we know the story that the brothers sold Joseph, sold him in his care to be a slave forever. We're not going to go into the story of why they did it and what their thoughts were, but we know the story. So fast forward 22 years, and now Joseph is the all-powerful ruler of Egypt, and the brothers are at his mercy. And of course, first he acts as this cruel Egyptian advisor to give them a situation where they can truly repent for what they did. But after that, when he exposes himself to them, when he reveals that he's their brother Joseph, for the rest of his life, which was many years, he is taking care of them. He is taking care of them. Come to the land and give you the best land. I... I'm going to give you food and give you jobs and support you. I'm taking care of you. And 
the brothers at a certain point were like, you're feeling like really guilty and uncomfortable. Like we were horrible to you. And you're like being unbelievably nice to us, like beyond normal nice. And we were beyond normal, the opposite. And Joseph said to them, he said, well, you might argue with his metaphor, but this is how he expressed it. He said, if someone wants to give you a cup of poison, but they messed up and sent me a cup of poison, they gave you a cup of the best wine. Shouldn't you thank them? Don't you owe them a, a nice thank you for the wine? You want to harm me. But everything's from God. So even though you want to harm me, what happened was good for me. Because God only does good. So if you did such good for me, I shouldn't thank you. Very, very, very powerful lesson. A very, very, very powerful point to think of. That everything's from God. So whatever happens in our world, it's all what God wants. So when something happens to us, when a person is the vehicle for something happening in our world, and that thing does not feel good, that thing feels really bad, that thing is really uncomfortable, difficult, painful. If we can just think and try to raise ourselves, of course, this is a very, very, very high bar. But however close we can get to it, at least we should understand the model that could be this person intended to harm me. Could be they did harm me. But everything's from God. He rules the world. He wants this to happen to me. How do I know he wants this to happen to me? Because it did. And if he didn't want to happen, it wouldn't happen. He's God. He rules. Well, if this is coming from God, this is for my bad, this is for my good. God only does good. We don't have these two options with God. Everything with God is for my good. There is no for my bad from God. So I know God wanted this to happen because it happened. I know God only does good. So this was good. Did the person mean to help me? No, not at all. They meant to mess me over completely. But that's not relevant. They meant to give me that cup of poison. They meant to harm me. But at the end of the day, they were God's tool and God's only good. So if I do or don't get it, this was good for me. If someone did good for me, I have to think. The rabbit here is saying, and again, it's it's I'm not saying it's simple to assimilate, but it's a very powerful, much higher level tool. Instead of just struggling not to say that, struggling not to say that, struggling not to say that, struggling not to listen to it, struggling not to say it and listen to it, to, to shift your thinking to even just in general, really loving people and not wanting to harm them. And somebody who harmed you, who you got really hurt by, saying, this is what God wanted. And God only wants my good. This person was a vehicle for God's good. If we can try this, we can try a little experiment now, just to practice this not easy, but very powerful tool, um, I'd like each one of us to think of a situation in our lives. I will not ask you to share it. Don't worry, unless you want to. But it could be as private as you want because you don't have to talk to anyone. But think of a situation where someone hurt you. I'm sure we've all been hurt by people in this world. That's, again, part of the human experience. So we've all been hurt. Or they really hurt you. A, a real hurt. Can't think of anything too bad. That's awesome. But, and then think of it and think of them and envision them. This is God's tool. This was God's tool. God wanted this to happen. Why? Because he loves me. Because he knows this is best for me. No, it was not best. It was horrible. That's my short-sighted vision. Maybe, maybe I have enough hindsight that I can have more 2020 accuracy here and I can see how it was good and how it helped me and how it deepened me and made me sensitive and made me vulnerable, took me off the wrong path in life, put me on the right path, whatever. And maybe I can. Maybe it's still too soon to know all that. 
but I know everything that happens is God. And I know God is only good. And God has absolute love for me. And whatever happened was part of his love. And this person was the tool of his love. Now, obviously, we never want to be the tool of bad expressing God's love for another person. We always want to be the tool of good. And obviously, if someone is a tool of bad, it does reflect on them that they are the tool of bad. But that's between them and God. That's what I'm doing with me. Meaning, if someone yeah. like sticks out his foot for you to trip and fall flat on your face, yeah. and you trip and fall flat on your face, they made a wrong choice. 100%. And who knows what's going to be between them and God for that wrong choice. But that's not my end. My end is God wanted me to fall on my face. And God loves me. So falling on my face was good for me. Why? I don't know. I might figure it out. I might not figure it out. I might figure it out tomorrow. I might figure it out in many tomorrows. I might never figure it out. But God's only good. He wanted this to happen to me because he loves me. So between this person and God, for this person's choice to stick out his foot and have me fall on my face, God's going to deal with the person. That's a separate calculation. That's going to do with me. But between me and this person, this person was a vehicle of God's goodness. Because whatever happened, happened. That's what God wanted. And therefore, it's part of his goodness. And I have to view them that way. So if we can take a few minutes now to just think of one situation in your life. If you find this very helpful, you can think of many more on your own time. But I just want to at least model it once now together. We could think of a situation something that happened, someone that harmed us. And just think of that. This was with God's will. This came directly from God. God wanted this to happen. This was for my best. Maybe I now even have the hindsight to understand why it was for my best. Maybe I'll understand later. Maybe I never will, but that doesn't remove it from being my best. And this person, therefore, was God's messenger to give me good. And I have to view them as such. God's messenger to give me good. So I was thinking about this as you were saying and everything. And <laughs> like what the situations I was kind of like talking about like earlier. You know, it's so funny. It's just like as you were saying it and everything, it's like I was able to see it in like such a completely different light. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And and so I just kind of wanted to share because I don't know if this will help somebody else but you know you know sometimes people do things to us or treat us in certain ways or, or there's things that happen to us through you know through other people that that make our lives so very challenging and and, and you know we question like what do we even do in cer certain situations because it's so heavy you know but what I <laughs> just seen like through like what you were saying is that these people's actions have really pushed me into like the whole camp of how do I be a better person? What does it even look like to be a good person and to be a good human being and to be on the path of righteousness and, you know, to be interested in taking these classes and, you know, it's like, gosh, you know, if they hadn't have shown me what, how like behaving like this impacts relationships, maybe I would be doing it too. But because I've not only seen how it, that behavior impacts relationship, but because I've experienced the pain of being on the other side of it, you know, I have, I have a, I have a way different life than I would have otherwise. You made very different choices, right? From very deep need, and if you didn't have that deep need, you wouldn't have had the fortitude to make such difficult choices. And I mean, and, and I'm thankful to push him for them because they were absolutely his messengers. And, you know, I don't know, I, I just pray for their own peace. I mean, that's really huge. I mean, I'm telling you, I've been in therapy a lot of years <laughs> and I've never gotten to this point. Thank you. And it's just really huge. Hold it in your heart and work that muscle a few times. Like keep coming back to that image, keep coming back to that image because if it's such a, a big shift, you know, it's losing, like, I know I felt this yesterday, but I don't know what I was thinking. I wrote it all down. <laughs> okay, good. Keep coming back to the image. Keep coming back to the image. Keep keep envisioning God's messenger for my good. And I know the good. I, I, I see God's plot. It's so <laughs> obvious. 
30 years later, gas <laughs> plot. It's it's his fingerprints are all over it. And these were the messengers. Well, couldn't they have been messengers in a softer fashion? No, because it wouldn't have worked. The plot wouldn't have worked. Uh -huh. The plot to work, it had to be harsh medicine. You know, harsh, harsh stuff. Strong stuff. Difficult stuff. But God knew what he was doing. And these were his messengers for my... Uh, I don't know if anyone else had such an epiphany uh, thought. Well, it's worth working through. And it's worth working through different situations where we where we've where we've experienced that pain. And obviously, again, we're not talking about minor things because hopefully you've gotten over the minor things yourself. And hopefully you don't hold the grudge against the person. But if you do, it's 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 good that this muscle should be very fine-tuned. If you find yourself hurt by this person, hurt by this person, hurt by this person, just constantly framing it like, thank you for being God's messenger. Thank you for giving me that gift today. What was the gift when they were so rude to you? Yeah, it was It was God's message for me today. Why? I don't know. Maybe I do know. Maybe I don't know. But they're God's messengers. They're choosing to be God's messengers. I don't know what they're doing. But God's moving his palms. God knows exactly what he's doing. This is God's messenger. This is God's messenger. This was God's message. This is God's messenger. Sometimes, like Christelle's saying, we go through hard situations and that makes us make much better choices about our own life. Sometimes we're in a hard situation that changes the path of our life and we're like, oh, wow, I could have been walking that road for the last 30 years. Wow. That's really good that that person was so nasty to me. You know, or, or sometimes it's just a real learning curve or whatever's going on, whatever we need to learn. So it's really, really wonderful, powerful, empowering, and freeing, liberating exercise to really, really get into that image of this person, God's messenger for my good. And again, it doesn't make a difference if they think they're handing me a cup of poison. God's in control. They handed me a cup of wine. And for the wine, I owe a tip. And that's, that's the point. The altar I was making here in Tanya. This person did something good for you. Not that they meant to, but that's not the issue. They did. And when someone does something good for you, you repay them with good. It's not easy. And certain, certain personalities, of course, have a harder time with it. But it's not easy for any of us. But it's really, as Christelle was saying, very, very healing. And a far higher level work than just I'm not going to speak bad about another person, but really get into the space of, wow, I have to give them even more love. Just keep in mind, as bad and as destructive as negative speech is, that's how much even more beneficial is this power of positive speech. Praising, speaking positively, Feeling warm, feeling positive, benefits the person, benefits you, benefits society, benefits the world. So it's so much deeper work. It's so much better work. To specifically those people that in the past have hurt us, reframing those situations, and in the moment, Someone did something that would trigger you. It's a small thing. It's not something you can hold in your heart for 20 years. But at this moment, you want to say something nasty about them? Reframing it. God's messenger for my good. Why was that for my good? That she cut off my car and I had to go in the store and find her. At God's messenger for my good. I understand the lesson. I don't. I will. I won't. God's messenger for my good. When I can look at everyone in my world that way, it makes it a very, very positive, loving, beautiful world. This was our third final session on this topic. Obviously, it's a topic we all work on. And I hope from each of the classes, you gain something, you learn something, and you're applying it 
because of course this is all supposed to be practical application. If someone has something else they'd like me to start working on next week, let me know. Otherwise, I was thinking just because of the timing, we should start maybe reviewing some of those laws of idolatry, just to like keep ourselves focused in, in the coming weeks. That was my thought. But again, if someone has something they'd like me to discuss, I'm totally open. Have a wonderful week. Christelle, keep that epiphany thought nurtured in your heart. And for the rest of us, we should also work on it and really take away those spaces of darkness inside of ourselves and fill them with light. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining. Shabbat thank you. Shabbat